excited to get this opportunity from them. When they called me in January, um, you know, I knew that it was a God thing. I knew that God ordained and destined this moment and this divine appointment. Now, I am um, a pastor, I'm a minister, but I'm also um, a teacher by trade. For six years, I taught high school, ninth and 10th graders. Yes, you probably would want to lift me up in prayer if I was still there. Ninth and 10th graders for about six years. And so, as we're talking today, Um, And as we're ministering today, I want you to help me with the message. So sometimes I'm going to ask you to repeat things after me. Sometimes I'm going to ask for your engagement, okay? And so we are just going to practice that right now because we want to be ready when it's time, okay? So repeat after me, God is good. good. Repeat after me, "All all the time. God is good. All the time. All right, so you're ready. So when I say repeat after me, I know that I'm going to get that same just level of enthusiasm um, and energy that you all just gave me there. So I know that Five Stones has been in um, a marriage uh, series. It's just coming out of a marriage series. And so what we want to do is before we jump into this word, we want to just lift up this message in this time in prayer. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, just for this time together, God. This is the day that you have made, Father, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, God. We thank you, Father, that we just surrender our wills, our agendas, even our words to the Spirit of the Lord. And we say, Father, you minister to your people today. I thank you, Lord, that you open hearts. I thank you, Lord, that you open minds. I thank you, Lord, that you set an expectation in the heart of your people, God, to receive not a word from me, but a word from you. That you meet them, Father, right where they are, and that you give them exactly what they need. Have your way is our prayer. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 So again, I know that we um, uh, Five Stones was just recently in a marriage season. And I'm not sure, but perhaps you have heard the story of this husband who was very upset with his wife. Now, y'all are probably thinking, yes, I've heard a lot of stories of husbands being upset with their wives, but this one is specific. See, this wife had accidentally left the car running, and the husband was livid. He was upset. And so he bolts into the house, and he says to the wife, I don't know how God could have made someone so beautiful and yet so dumb. Now, I see all the wives cringe a little bit because if you're a wife, that probably wouldn't set very well with you. And so, of course, the wife was angry in that moment. And so then the the wife responds and she says, let me tell you why God did that. God made me so beautiful because he wanted you to love me, but God made me so dumb so that I would love you. (laughs) Now, clearly, this story is not a good nor a godly example of how we are called to relate to each other in our marriages or even in our relationships, but it does illustrate the dysfunction and adversity. Say adversity that can and will arise as we journey through this life. I've been married to my wonderful husband, Todd, for over 21 years. And of course, over this time, we have been met with some struggles. We have been met with some adversity, not only as a couple, but individually as well. We've been met with spiritual attacks. We've been met with physical illness. We've been met with disagreements and financial struggles. And we have seen our fair share of adversity. Say adversity. Is there anyone in the house who has ever experienced some adversity or some trouble or struggle before? Amen. Is there anyone in the house who is experiencing some struggle and trouble and adversity right now in this moment 
Amen. Thank you for your honesty. There is no shame. There is no condemnation in the house of the Lord. Do you know that when we ask ourselves questions like this and we are brutally honest and we are raising our hands, we are literally slapping the enemy in the face? From the beginning of time, he has used shame and condemnation to control us and to keep us out of the presence and the blessed life that God has called us to. So when we're going through this message and we're talking about adversity, reflect and just be totally honest with yourselves. The worship team, the prayer moment, it set the atmosphere for freedom. And so if you don't leave this this moment with the freedom that God has for you, then it's not because God is not doing what he wants to do. It's not because he doesn't have freedom available to you. So God sent me here today to really focus and talk about adversity, the adversity that you have experienced, the adversity that you are experiencing right now, and the adversity that you will experience. All of these things are not meant to kill you. They're not meant to harm you. They're not meant to destroy you. They're not meant to make you give up. The Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God loves you. The Lord your God has not forsaken you. The Lord your God loves you. But when we look at adversity, adversity is really the doorway to all comfort. Repeat after me, adversity is the doorway to all comfort. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So let's look at our scripture. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 10. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 10. And it reads this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Have you ever experienced such great adversity that you felt it was a death sentence? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Adversity, the doorway to all comfort. So when we look at adversity, it's all about how we view it. See, God wants us to look at adversity through a different lens. He wants us to view it a certain way. He wants us to steward it a certain way. He wants, it, wants us to handle it a certain way because how we handle adversity is very key to us being disciples. How we handle adversity is very key to building the kingdom of God. The Bible says, and it is a guarantee that we will experience trial, tribulation, affliction, adversity. It says you will have trials and tribulation. You will have adversity. And so 
if we change our lens, we must view adversity in a different way. That it isn't trying to steal from us. That it isn't trying to kill us. That it isn't trying to destroy us. That is the enemy's goal. That is not God's goal. Adversity is a tool that God utilizes. But what the enemy means for evil, God will use it for our good every single time because God is good. Adversity actually introduces and keeps us connected to the one who holds everything together. Adversity, while challenging and difficult, produces something in each and every one of us. As we're going through those difficulties, how many of us, when life is, uh, was going good and everything was well, you, you read your Bible a little bit less, right? You, thank, you, thank you for your honesty, sir. You found other things to do. You filled your time with things, but as soon as adversity hits, we're at the altar, we're on our face, and we're crying out to God. And God is saying, yes, I'm using this adversity to connect you to me. I want you to be connected to me all the time, but sometimes I have to allow adversity in your life so that you will be drawn to me, the God of all comfort. Our adversity is the doorway to all comfort. Now, when we look at this uh, text in 2 Corinthians, where Paul has written his second letter uh, to the Corinthian church, in studying this, many scholars believe that Paul may have written a couple of other letters to the Corinthian church as well. Some believe that 2 Corinthians is composed of two letters. Others believe that there may have been some letters that were lost. And so whether it's two letters, whether it's four letters, whether it's 4,000 letters, what we do know is that Paul was a man. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ called by God, probably the greatest missionary of the first century, and his life was filled with adversity. Paul was subjected to every pain, every distress, every injury. He was brutally beaten by stones. He was shipwrecked three times at sea. He was savagely slashed by whippings. He faced danger and death too many times to be counted. He experienced pain. He experienced exhaustion and hunger and loneliness for most of his life. Here was a man who never knew what the next day might bring, whether or not he would be dead, whether or not he would be alive, for his enemies were many and cruel and mighty, and yet he spent the great part of his time praising and blessing God. This was a heart check for me, y'all, because when When I'm going through adversity, I had to ask myself the question, what do you spend your time doing while you are going through adversity? Do you you spend your time exalting and praising your adversity? Or do you expend and experience all of your time, spend it on exalting and praising your God? Where do you spend your time? I want to ask the question, in today's society, if Paul was an apostle in today's time, what would the news probably be saying about Paul with all of the adversity that he experienced? They would probably be saying, is he really an apostle? Is he really a man of God? The hand of the Lord must be against him. Didn't you see him being stoned out there last week? He couldn't possibly be a man of God. He couldn't possibly be somebody that knows God. Is he praying enough? Is he believing enough? Is he worshiping enough? We would have criticized and critiqued 
But there is so much we can learn from Paul. This was a man who experienced great adversity, but also a man of even greater faith and purpose. Paul was a man on assignment from God. He was called by God. Now, before studying this, I kind of just made the assumption that Paul was probably well-respected in this Corinthian church. Wouldn't we make that assumption? Like he's an apostle, he's a man of God, he's a follower of Jesus Christ, he's been called. But in studying this message through, Paul was not celebrated by this church. It, he was actually held in low regard by the Christians there. That's why at the beginning of the letter, he has to remind the church of his credentials. He says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul didn't allow adversity to shape him. Paul didn't allow those Christians' opinions of him to shape and define who he was. We have to get to the place where we don't allow our adversity to define us. We don't allow people's opinions to keep us in a place of shame and condemnation. Even though Paul knew he was held in, in low regard, that did not stop him from his assignment. That did not stop him from following through on his mission. And it should not stop us any longer as well. You are on assignment from God. Say, I am on assignment from God. He has called you by name and there is a purpose and a plan that he has on your life. I remember there was a season in my life when I was younger when I used to always pray and live for the day when everything in my life was right. Has, has, has anybody in the room ever been there where we were looking for this perfect place? And so I would pray, oh, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that one day my finances will be right. Oh, Lord, I thank you, Father, that one day my relationships will be right. One day, Lord, I thank you, Father, that, that everything will be right, and then you can use me, and then I can be who it is that you've called me to be. But the problem was we were worried about the wrong thing. Our struggle and our trouble is never going to be right, but the God that we follow is always going to be right, and he is the one who makes us right. I was reading John 16 and 33 back then, and it says, this is Jesus talking. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Adversity is something we can expect. Adversity is something we can expect. Adversity is something we can expect. But instead of trying to run from it, instead of trying to fix it in our natural strength, we have to turn to the author and the finisher. We have to run to the only one that we can find peace in. See, this letter was to inform God's people, this mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles of different genders and socioeconomic backgrounds, that adversity is the doorway to the God of all comfort. Again, this letter was to inform God's people, a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles of different genders and socioeconomic backgrounds, that adversity is the doorway to the God of all comfort. You can have a lot of money, but it's not going to keep you away from adversity. You can have a lot of fame, but it's not going to keep you away from adversity. See, it's not that my situations and my circumstances will ever be right, but the God of peace and comfort will always be right. EnduringWord.com, it says, The words all comfort in this passage come from the ancient Greek word paracleses. The idea behind this word for comfort in the New Testament is always more than soothing sympathy. When we say comfort, don't think soothing, soothing sympathy. When we say comfort, it is the idea of strengthening, of helping, of making strong. The idea behind the word is the Latin word fortis, which also means to make brave. 
This letter was to inform the people that God's power, his strength, his help is brought to people in their weakness, not in human strength. See, when I first read John 16 and 33, and it was like, uh, you will have trouble. I, I, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. My control button kicked in. How many of us have a control button that sometimes kicks in? I see some hands. I have one that we, that we have to turn off very often. And so when my control button kicked in, then I started trying to figure out how to get out of the adversity. I started making plans. I started saying, well, if I do this, then this might happen. And I came up with this elaborate plan, an elaborate scheme. And when we try to handle adversity in our own strength, we're creating a weight that God never meant for us to carry. And in our trying to fix and figure out and manipulate and maneuver out of a situation, instead of going to the God of all comfort, we actually create more struggles, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of the people around us. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. See, it is in him that we live, we move, and we have our being. Adversity is something that all of us will experience, but adversity is something that we should move through, not carry. As we are moving through adversity, God doesn't want us to become a carrier of adversity. What does a carrier of adversity look like? Someone who's always trying to fix stuff. Someone who places blame on those around them. Someone who uses shame as a weapon. We have to stop blaming. We have to stop shaming. We have to stop trying to fix things. And we have to realize that adversity is the doorway to the God of all comfort. See, our adversity is to lead us directly to him so that he can strengthen us, so that he can help us, so that he can lift us up. Don't get caught up in the thought process that the challenges, troubles, and struggles are an attack on you or trying to figure out what you are doing wrong. I can honestly say through all the, the Troubles, struggles, adversity. There was a point in my life when I was always looking at other people and saying, this is an attack on me. Why are you attacking me? Why are they doing this to me? Or I would be spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out, what didn't I do right? Did I not read enough? Did I not pray enough? I tithed. I gave my offerings. I would go through all of these different movements and motions And finally, God says, that is not going to bring you peace. It it, it matters what comes into our lives, but what matters more is who you and I run to when the adversity comes. We have to shift our focus. There is someone in here today, as I was preparing this message, and you know, uh, for those who have ever prepared a message, sometimes the Lord is like, say this, and you're like, huh? Huh? And he's like, no, I want you to say that. And you're like, you want me to say what? So we have to be obedient. So he he says specifically, there is someone in here today who has been struggling because you feel like the situation and circumstances you are in is someone else's fault. And it's consuming you. But hoping they fall is not the answer. Hoping they experience the hell you are going through is not the solution. Proverbs 24, 17 through 18. Whoever this is for, see, the Lord meant this for you because he said put it right here and give a scripture with it so, so they really know I'm speaking to them. Proverbs 24, 17 through 18. I'm going to read two different translations. The ESV. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. The Passion Translation, same scripture. Never gloat when your enemy meets disaster and don't be quick to rejoice if he falls. For the Lord who sees your heart will be displeased with you. 
and will pity your foe. Forgiveness and grace is the only way. Forgiveness isn't saying that what they did was okay, but it releases you from the chains that are actually connecting you to them. It releases you from the prison. It releases you from the bondage. And and when you forgive, you're going to fall right into the arms of the God of all comfort. The God who takes care of you and all of your needs. The God who fights all of your battles. Adversity is the doorway to the God of all comfort. Now, I'm going to give us three actions. So if you're note takers and you haven't been taking notes thus far, this is your opportunity. Three actions we should take away when we are in the midst of adversity. Three actions we should take away and we should uh, walk out when we're in the midst of adversity. Action number one, receive his comfort. Receive his comfort. Adversity is an invitation to experience the comfort of God. The more adversity that we experience, even though it may be something that our flesh dislikes, our flesh actually hates, the adversity on the, and through the adversity on the other side of the adversity, we experience a greater level of his power. We experience a greater level of his his presence. We experience a greater level of all of the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes when we're walking through adversity, you just need to go to Galatians 5 and 22 and look at all the fruit of the Spirit and look at your adversity and ask God, now which one of these am I supposed to be working on? Because a lot of times the adversity that we are going through is trying to grow and produce and strengthen a part of the fruit of the spirit that has not been tested. Or sometimes we need to do a retest because we think we're okay. And then God says, oh, let me just throw, throw that in there. And then you realize, wow, I'm really not okay. And I need to continue to work on that. But if you're thinking, Pastor Tanya, that's not what I experience. I don't experience a greater level of faith. I don't experience a greater level of of strength and power. When I get met with the trial, I feel like God has left me. I feel like he has forsaken me. Then it's time for us to challenge ourselves. A lot of times we don't receive God's comfort to the level he wants us to because we choose to reject that invitation. When we're going through, we isolate. That's what rejecting that invitation looks like. When we isolate, when we avoid, when we try to fix, when we try to manipulate, when we try to solve the problem on our own. We have to be like Paul. In Romans 5 through through 5, he says, we can rejoice. Say rejoice. When we run into problems and trials, for we know that the They help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Paul says we can rejoice and we should rejoice when trials and tribulations come. How many of us start rejoicing when trials and tribulations come? I'm going to put my hands down and behind my back because that is not our default setting to rejoice when trials and tribulations come. But because now we know that adversity is a tool that God uses, we can trust that when the problem or the trial comes, he will be with us. We can trust that when we're met with that adversity, he will not leave us nor forsake us. We can trust that he will be walking with us every step of the way. And that is something to rejoice in. That is something to rejoice in. And when we get the revelation of how much it says in that that scripture, God dearly loves us. God dearly loves me. God dearly loves you. When we get that revelation of how much God dearly loves us, then we are able to rejoice. 
We receive his comfort. We accept that invitation when we surrender and walk through the doorway of adversity into the arms of the God of all comfort. We receive his comfort through surrender, not our will, not our understanding, not our agenda, but in trusting his will, in trusting his wisdom. Receiving his comfort is about surrender and submission. You want to open the invitation? Then be brutally honest with yourself and say, I can't do this on my own. You can't do this on your own. I can't do this on my own. We can't do this on our own. We need our Heavenly Father. When we surrender and submit, God's ordained authority is authorized. When we say, though you slay me, yet will I trust you, his love and his peace floods and rains. Though you slay me, Lord, yet will I trust you. Practice that. Say that. Make that your default. As soon as you try to start manipulating and controlling, just get to a quiet place and say, Lord, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I promise you he'll show up every time. Action uh, number two, distribute his comfort. Distribute his comfort. Adversity is an opportunity for you and I to introduce other people to the God of all comfort. You have a position and a role to play. See, God is trying to get his comfort to you so he can move his comfort through you. God says, I want you to be a distributor of my presence, a distributor of my truth, a distributor of my word, a distributor of my character. See, through adversity, we should be receiving and distributing the comfort of God. He wants to use you in this way. But what happens is instead of us receiving and distributing the comfort of God and reflecting his glorious light, grace, and mercy, we end up complaining or worrying or being fearful or doubting that he is on our side. And God has not given us the spirit of fear. See, when going through, we should say, how can I serve somebody else? When we are going through, we should look at that adversity and say, Lord, is there something that I can do for someone right now while I'm going through this adversity? Or Lord, is this something that you want me to use in the future to bless somebody, to change somebody, to transform their life? The Bible says we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But we don't get a testimony unless we have a test. And so then when we get that test, then we can share with somebody else. We can speak into somebody else's life. You don't know how many divine appointments God has waiting for you. Not based on you knowing a whole lot of scripture. Get that out of your head. Don't be like, I can't go up to somebody and share something with somebody because you're fearful that you don't know enough, because you're fearful that you don't have enough scripture. God is saying, I want to use your testimony. Let's start there. I brought you out of some things. I brought you through some things. And you don't realize that the person uh, across the room, across the aisle in the grocery store, at your workplace, you don't realize that the same thing that you went through that I brought you through, they're going through that same thing right now. How you are able to distribute his comfort can have more impact than any sermon delivered on any platform. Your life is a platform that God wants to use to introduce people to his truth, his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his spirit. Back in 2020, uh, right before the pandemic shut everything down, my dad passed away. And it was amazing how the people who had that similar experience of a parent or an immediate family member passing away, their encouragement was different. The words that they used were totally different. How they ministered and spoke was totally different. Why? Because they had experienced it for themselves. They had felt the comfort of God for themselves. They had walked through it themselves so they knew what to say and what 
not to say. Has anybody ever had an experience before where you have had someone close to you pass away? Anybody? How many of us had some people say some things where we were like, I don't want you to say that? I don't, I, that's not very encouraging. Please keep that to yourself. But the people who had experienced, I mean, it was just like, it was uh, transforming how they could encourage, how they could touch my heart. And I remember I was uh, writing out uh, the different thank you letters. And so I actually got a thank you letter back from somebody I wrote a thank you letter to. And this young man wrote in the letter, it was my pleasure to be of encouragement to you. Look for people to be of encouragement to. Make that your pleasure. Make that your goal. Make that what you strive for to be a distributor of his presence, of his love, of his grace, of his mercy. When we look at Paul in Acts 16, there was a moment where he was in prison. And, and, and he was in prison, and he was on assignment, and he knew he was on assignment. He wasn't trying to figure out how to get out of his adversity. He wasn't trying to figure out how to leave the jail in the prison. He was on assignment. He was singing songs of praise and worship to the Lord. He was praising to the Lord. He was distributing God's presence in his adversity. So much so to the point that when the earthquake came and the foundations were shaken and the prison doors were open and Paul could have run out, he didn't. He stayed right where he was. And as a result of that, the jailer asked, how can I be saved? And as a result of that, the jailer and his entire household was saved. God wants to use you in the midst of your adversity. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your focus on him. The word says that he, he keeps those in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on him because they trust in him. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. Say, use me, God. I'm ready to distribute more of you. Last action, rest in his comfort. Rest in his comfort. When we look at from our original uh, text, uh, 2 Corinthians, verses 9 and 10, uh, Paul says, um, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of, of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope and he that he will deliver us again. How do we rest in his comfort? We focus on the again of God. Say the again, the again. Of, God. of God. We focus on the again of God. What does that look like? Has God delivered you from anything? Anybody? Has God saved you? Has God raised dead things in your life? Has he healed your broken heart? God has a track record. I, I can't even put the numbers of zeros behind it. I'm going to make up a word of kajillion, mammalian, scotillion to zero. He never loses. God always wins. See, Paul was convinced. Paul didn't say he might deliver us again. Paul didn't say hopefully he'll make it through. Paul didn't say maybe he'll stop by. He said that he will deliver us again. And the only way to rest in his comfort is to know that he will do it again. He loves you. He has not forsaken you. He has not left you. He is the God of all comfort. He is the God of all peace. He is a healer. He is a provider. He is a deliverer. If you are looking for an answer, he is your answer. If you're looking for a solution, he is your solution. The solution to suffering is to set aside what we feel in favor of what we know. 
The solution to suffering is to set aside what we feel in favor of what we know. Don't be led by your feelings. Be led by what you know. Romans 8 and 28 says, all things are working together for the good, for your good. Know that, trust that, believe that. He will save you, he will deliver you, he will fight for you. Be convinced of that just as Paul was. He will do it again. He will heal your broken heart again. He will bring you into better times again. He will walk with you through the valley again. He will be with you on the mountaintop again. He loves you. He loves you. And so we're going to close. If the, the altar ministry uh, team could just uh, come to the front, because if you don't know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you're, then you're not going to be in a position to experience the God of all comfort. That is the, that is the first step. He wants to free you from your brokenness. He wants to free you from your hurt. He wants to free you from your pain. He wants you to rely solely and totally and completely on him. He loves you. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. He knows the number of hairs that you have on your head. He, he knows every mistake that you were going to make even before you made it. But he provided a way of escape in Jesus. So if you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, Make your way to the front and let somebody pray for you.